All right, I think this is not as awkward as possible. It'll get better. I can't, I don't even know. I don't know, guys. There we go. Is that better? That's a little better. Hi, welcome to my page. If you're here, it's probably because you either know me from TikTok or the algorithm has worked in your favor and you mostly like spooky, creepy shit. I really have to watch how much I'm gonna swear on these videos. I'm an Aries moon. That's gonna be really hard for me. You probably like spooky shit, probably also like food, and you also like being being under the influences. Can I say that on YouTube? We're gonna find out. I'm gonna worry about the sound. The neighbors upstairs, I'm really sorry, hopefully that is a thing. I can get better mics and better sound quality here. If you are here on my channel, it's because you like haunted history, you like spooky stuff, and you the algorithm has brought you to my page. This is a place where we can talk about haunted history, places in the world, in the US, that are haunted, and the history, the story attached to these places. I find that a lot of paranormal, supernatural content on YouTube just is either kind of like cheesy or not exactly what I'm looking for. You know, because no one's really made the kind of content that I would want to watch, I'm gonna make it myself and hopefully it gains, you know, some traction here. I've always been kind of sitting on, I've always been interested in, in this, but I want to do it while after I've enjoyed a couple of edible candies, if you know what I mean, and then eat a lot of really good food and just talk about some haunted places in the world. Ow. I have been on a no makeup kick for, I want to actually say close to a month, but I broke that kick just a little bit so I could put on some mascara, do my brows a little bit, wanted to look nicer for you guys. And I think we're going to have a visitor. Are you thinking about it? She's thinking about it. A cat. She might sneak through the table. Hi, baby. Yeah, you don't like bags. It's okay. Come here. She's hiding. She'll come out when she wants to. But yeah, I wanted to start this series just because I really like talking about paranormal, haunted, spooky shit. It's what I do for a living. I work full time as a psychic medium, but so this is just something that I kind of wanted to kind of expand on. Today, for the first video, I'm going to actually talk about the most haunted place in the US. That's not gonna be a thing. Cricket, you're not doing this while I'm filming. Anyways. No. Don't do it. Cricket. I see you. Yeah, I see you. This is gonna be fun. Filming with a pet. A cat, nonetheless. So, I wanted my first video to be on the most haunted house in America, according to Time Magazine, and I feel like a lot of people don't actually know where this house is, but it is... Hey! It is actually the Whaley House, and it is here in San Diego, where I am from. She always wants to do this. She always wants to play with the loudest toys when I'm trying to film anything. Why do you do this? Okay, so, as I was saying, here in San Diego, Whaley House. That's what we're going to be talking about today. I'm from San Diego, and I've only been to the Whaley House once and it was for like a third or fourth grade field trip not much that i really remember it we didn't really we didn't go inside the house at all it was mostly just looking at it from the outside but i feel like a lot of people don't know this but it actually is the most haunted house in america i feel like a lot of people think it's probably like the winchester house up in san jose which i also can't wait to do a video on a lot of people think it's you know like the, it would be like the lizzie borden murder house it's not it's the whaley house and after actually reading more about the story and the family and kind of the history that's tied to the land, it makes sense as to why it's the most haunted house in America. There's so much that happened on this property and on this land, even before Thomas Whaley moved to San Diego and decided to make that place his home. You have to look at what was going on, who was here, before any sort of European settlers, descendants of European settlers moved out here. And as we all know, some of us are kind of still unwilling to admit, America was founded on stolen native land. Long before Christopher Columbus or any of his unwashed men sat, you know, set foot on this beautiful country that we call the United States, there were people that were living here. Where San Diego is, is actually on occupied Kumeyaay territory. What we now know as the US-Mexico border that separates San Diego from Tijuana was actually intentionally placed there 
by the US government. And in doing that, they completely broke up generations of native people and families and tribes that have been living on this land for millennia. And even as late as like the 1970s, there were Kumeyaay natives living in now Tijuana or, you know, down, down south in Mexico that would come up to visit their relatives or family members in the north, they would get turned away at the border because they didn't know there was a border, they didn't know that they needed a passport to go see their family members that lived north, that traditionally, historically, have lived just north above them. As late as the 1970s, like that's wild to me. That is another video for another time. It's important to know anything that was built after European colonization of this country, like the Whaley House, does stand on native territory, on native land. Actually a part of San Diego that historically has had a lot of battling and fighting over in what we now know as Old Town in San Diego. And that's where the house still stands today. The house had actually been used as multiple different businesses throughout the decades. It operated as a courtroom, it operated as a billiards hall, it operated as a theater, the first commercial theater in San Diego at one point. It operated as a granary, it operated as a general store. It was also built on top of a graveyard. Yeah. Any historians of the Whaley House or anyone who's really into like paranormal history and that kind of shit, knows that building something that was on top of a graveyard where bodies and souls have been laid to rest is probably a recipe for disaster, not good. And I think because of this, a lot of historians and people that are into this kind of stuff would say that the Whaley House was kind of destined to be haunted just because of everything that surrounded the land, everything that surrounded the, the family itself, what the Whaley family brought with them when they moved to California. I think it can actually be argued that the Whaley House, which now is operated thanks to a foundation called Save the Heritage Foundation, and it also operates as a museum and tourist attraction, it's probably witnessed the most amount of history since the time that San Diego became a thing. Like reading about this house and this family, what they saw, what they experienced, it's all a lot of history. Okay, I just need to stop talking and actually start telling you the story. First, I wanna get into what I'm eating today. You can sit down with me if you are also eating something and we can learn a little bit about this haunted history together. I am trying to support local business and, and where I live. So I got lunch from a little barbecue place. It's a little place called When Pigs Fly Barbecue. I feel like I got a lot of food. This is a lot for one person. Okay, I got like their three meal and then two sides and they give you option of like a Hawaiian roll or a regular like cornbread biscuit. And I got their mac and cheese, which looks so good. And I got their coleslaw. And then for their meat, I got tri-tip chicken I'm pretty sure brisket. This is a lot of food. I got, I wanted to try their hot dogs because I've been craving hot dogs. Like I just want to try a really good hot dog. So I got one of their hot dogs and onion rings as a side. And then I got a very small side of macaroni salad because I wanted to try their macaroni salad because I love macaroni salad. That is what I got today. I didn't realize like, oh, talking and eating <laughs> would have to be a thing that I would be doing. I'm going to try the mac and cheese first because honestly, this has been calling my name. Okay. Wow, that revived me. Amazing. Oh, I was like, where is their sauce? Let me see. Bing. This looks really good. I think it's just all one sauce. Let me try. I think this is their... Mm. Oh my god. Oh my god, the sauce. Focus, Annie. You're here to talk about haunted shit. This is so good. This was a good choice. This was a great decision. <laughs> Whose idea was this? Me. I need to start telling you the story. I do have some notes here to help me, like, keep me on track because I'm... I'm multitasking. I can try this whole sauce here. Oh, that's actually not too bad. So, the Whaley House. But do I start with the land or do I start with the family? I'll start with the family. I'll start with the family. Thomas Whaley. He is the patriarch of the family. He was born of Scots-Irish origin to parents in New York City on October 5th, 1823. Mmm. That needs more sauce. For sure. He was the seventh child of 10 in a family of 10, which I guess makes 
a lot of sense why they would have like so many children back during that time because like disease was so common and you didn't really know who was gonna make it or not which i feel like sounds morbid to say but like it happened. Even though his father died when he was nine years old, his father was a very successful businessman, so he left him a good amount of money in his will to get a good education, which is what he did. Mmm. Okay, I need to try one of these. Mmm. Ooh. Mmm. That has a little something in the batter. He got a good education at a place called Washington Institute. He eventually became a very successful businessman himself. He actually took over for his father's businesses that he had owned before he died. So he took over and ran his father's like general store business, which he actually did pretty well. And then he, I guess he just kind of got like tired of New York and wanted to kind of expand more. So on January 1st, 1849, he moved out West to California and landed in San Francisco. And he came along with thousands of other people who were moving out west because this was the time of the California gold rush. So a lot of people were moving out here to hopefully strike it rich, make some money, live the American dream, love the American dream, right? He continued his business ventures in San Francisco and he was actually very successful. He opened up a bunch of stores like on Montgomery Street and he was up there for a couple of years. And then in 1851, he came down to San Diego and he really, just kind of fell in love with this with the city he loved that it was smaller not as busy as san francisco he liked that it was a little warmer than being up north in san francisco there was something about the town that he just really liked so he decided that he wanted to make san diego his home but before he did that he wanted to go back home back east to new york and find a woman marry her and start a family that he could bring out with him to california this guy, now that I like say it out loud, literally was just like trying to live the American dream, but it makes you wonder like, what did he do? And what did his ancestors do? Like that just caused him and his descendants like so much suffering and sadness. Just like so much bad luck that seemed to follow this family. So that's what he did. He went back to New York and he ended up marrying a woman named Anna Eloise Delaney. I hope I'm pronouncing that right from France or I assume from a French heritage, but they got married on August 14th, 1853. And in just a few short months, they were already packed up and moving out to California. And by like December of that year, same year, just four months after they got married, they were already in San Diego. And it would take a few years for the house to actually get built and like constructed over time even though there were already some weird events that had already been taking place and been recorded before the family actually moved into their new home there was also talk of the fact that thomas wheely had purchased this land to build a home that was the site of a very public hanging oh yes my friends this tale is is much darker than i think a lot of people like realize it was recorded once in 1857, just shortly before they actually moved in that year. Thomas Whaley had come down to take note of, you know, the construction. He was kind of upset about the fact that it, it seemed like some parts of the house were moving along quicker than other parts of the house. So he was like, what's going on? Why is this taking so long? Okay, I have to try this chart tip. One second. Mmm. Holy, yep, yep, wow, that's really good. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, I hope they pay their chefs well, because this is really good. Water. Thomas Whaley's down there making notes, right? And it's recorded that there was this woman who came up to him and was whispering something in his ear like, you shouldn't build here, not after what they did to him, it's too dangerous, something along the lines of that. And she kept continuing on saying how whoever he is, he will never find peace and neither will Thomas and his family if they decide to build a house and move in. And then she just moseyed on down the street like she didn't just foretell Thomas's entire family like future. Okay, NBD. None of those things deterred Thomas, obviously. He was really adamant about building this house. It was going to be a house that had never been seen before in San Diego. He constantly bragged to his like friends and his neighbors that his home was going to be 
the most well lit and stylish and most comfortable house between there and like a 150 mile radius. It would also have a general store that was attached to it so they could continue to build on their family's wealth. He was actually recorded as saying, I have it written down here. My new house when completed will be the most handsome, most comfortable and convenient place in town or within 150 miles of here, end quote. Okay, that's a little cocky, Thomas. But San Diego was still a very new town being built. So, I mean, what else is there really? So within that year, August 22nd of 1853, now that I'm also saying this, August seems to be a very prevalent time. August and January seem to be very prevalent times in this family's history. Just saying, I might come back to that later, but I just noticed as I'm like putting all this stuff together. But on August 22nd, 1857, the Whaley's finally moved into their new home and immediately they started noting and recording hauntings and noises with, that were occurring within the walls of their home. Even within a few days, Anna Whaley, Thomas's wife, started noting certain sounds whenever she would go like to lie down and rest or go to bed. And to her, they sounded like really heavy thuds that were coming above in the attic. And at first she thought it might have been Thomas that was just kind of walking around up there, getting things settled, moving things until one night she was hearing them so heavily. And then she saw her bedroom door shut and it was Thomas who was getting ready to come to bed. She was like, okay, obviously not him. And it was just her and Thomas and their small children at the time. So she knew there was no way her children could go get up there and make that much noise. Even when Thomas seemed to be ignoring these sounds, she did her best to try and act like everything was okay. Everything was fine. She wasn't noticing these sounds and she could just chalk it up to the fact that it was a new house and they still needed to take time to, you know, just get used to the sounds and the machines, everything that was going on. Well, let me take a bite of this roll first. Okay, yeah, that whole thing's being eaten right now. Mm, this is so good. Oh my god. Except when I had cat hair. Ugh. Gross. But still, there were so many occurrences that happened in that house, both when the couple were together and when they were separate. That lent Anna to think that there was something a little more nefarious that was going on in the house at this time. There was one specific incident where Anna had taken the children back east to New York City to visit her parents and for a little vacation, leaving Thomas to kind of run the business and mind the home while she and the kids were away. And one night, Thomas was working late in the general store and he was stocking some goods. All of a sudden, he felt this like really dark heaviness that kind of like came over him. He just kind of had the feeling that something was there physically watching him. It physically affected him so much to the point where he had to go to the couch to lie down to kind of gather himself a little bit. So he went to the parlor and as he was lying down, he saw out of the corner of his eye behind him, a dark shadow. And as he kind of twisted around to see what it was, he could see the, this dark shadow that was kind of going up the staircase leading to the second floor. He was watching a shadow move up the second floor. And as he was watching it move up the floor, he could hear the thuds that he had tried so hard to ignore and that his wife was adamant that she was hearing in, in the attic as well. And it sounded like the boots were going in and out of each room almost to make sure like the coast was clear, there was no one there. And Thomas is just sitting there frozen, petrified on the couch, listening to this unseeable thing walk through his home, almost like it was kind of marking its territory a little bit. Just very unsettling and even when Anna returned, pause, I need to try, I need to try some of this hot dog because, oh my God. Oh, mm, okay. Someone needs to be kissed for that. I want to make out with whoever made that, whoever thought of it and then whoever made it. I want to make out with the, both of them. Mm. It's so good. Oh my God. Why did I wait so long to try that? Oh, oh. I see what we have here. I did get, okay. See, I knew I was looking out for me. Good job, Annie. I want this one right here. Okay. Mmm. 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 Wow. Someone needs to have something more than just 
beacus for that. Oh my god. This shit is so good. So, even when Anna returned, the noises, the things that he was seeing, he couldn't ignore anymore. He tried to talk himself out of it. He tried to rationalize, tried to think of some sort of explanation for everything that he was thinking, everything that he was seeing and, you know, experiencing. Anna seemed much more vocal and determined to get him to say, confess that yes, there was something going on in the house. Whereas Thomas, even though he was experiencing it, he, he was still kind of, you know, trying to keep it out of sight, out of mind. We're done. And there was one night after they had put their children to bed, Anna couldn't really contain her thoughts anymore. And she ended up confessing to Thomas that part of the reason why she did go back to New York wasn't just for a vacation. It was because she was afraid of her house. She was scared that there was something dark that and heavy that was there. She was afraid of their new home. She actually used the word sticking, as in she felt like there was something sticking to her from the spirit world. She didn't know of any other way to describe it. And what does Thomas do? What does Thomas do? Does he confide in his wife? Does he say, oh my God, I'm so glad you said something. Let's try and figure out what this is. Maybe figure out if we need to do something for our kids, for their safety. Does he do any of that? No, no. He gets angry. He gets angry at Anna. He calls her crazy. He tells her that she's sick and that she needs to see someone if she thinks that there's something going on in the house. He got very adamant that this is where we're leaving. There is nothing wrong with this house and you better buckle up because we're staying here forever. I think, I think he cursed himself with those words. He instantly came to you know, regret saying those words. Maybe not. Maybe in the afterlife, he's still really happy hanging around his house. The whole family stayed there for their whole lives, which I'll get to in a second. I feel like in the aftermath, short term, he would come to regret those words because that was, they moved in in August of 1857, right? January of 1858, literally six months in that time where they were experiencing these things, they had this conversation, he says, we're staying here forever, you're crazy, there's nothing wrong with the house. Boom, conversation done. Not done. Less than six months after that happened in late January of 1858, Thomas and Anna's youngest child, Thomas Whaley Jr., died of scarlet fever. And he was just 18 months old. And then within just a few weeks of that happening, the general store that was attached to their house caught fire and completely burned to the ground. So within less than a month, this family had not only lost their child, they lost their business, they lost their livelihood. Their lives were in complete shambles because of this. Less than six months after they had moved in. Now, it's possible that because this was the mid to late 19th century, it was very common for children to just contract diseases and die very young. Unfortunately, it did happen a lot more than it does now. And it's also possible that just back during that time, building codes and fire safety was probably not what we would deem adequate or safety today. So things have evolved things have gotten better. So it's completely possible that it just happened. However, the back-to-back -back nature of both of these tragedies seemed so opposite compared to the Wheel of Fortune that the Whaley family seemed to come from and seemed to emulate. Anna really couldn't shake the feeling that whatever it was that was making these noises and causing this general uneasiness in their home had something to do with Thomas Jr. passing. She really believed that it was responsible for not only their business burning down, but for her losing her youngest child. Very shortly after their son died, Thomas and Anna both started hearing the sound of a child crying coming from the attic, which was the same place that they heard these heavy thudding boot steps. And if it wasn't cries, then it was like laughter or some sort of like cooing or giggling. They both agreed that it sounded like their child. It sounded like Thomas Jr. And then whenever the laughing and the crying would kind of fade out, immediately they would hear the thud of the boot steps in the attic and it just sent a chill down both of their spines, especially Anna's, believing like she really had no other choice. She was so wrapped up in grief 
everything that had just happened so quickly since they had moved into this house, whatever this was also took her child. He didn't just pass away from natural causes because of scarlet fever. Okay, try to... Anna's trying really hard not to freak out, but she ends up confiding this theory, this fear that she has to a neighbor. That's when her and then Thomas eventually started learning about the ghost of a man who was possibly responsible for what had been going on to them and what had happened in their life recently. That coleslaw is like really good though. Keep talking. Focus. <laughs> this is kind of where a lot of the activity, you know, really started to take place before the Whaley's even moved down here. This guy was named James Robinson. He went by the name of Yankee Jim or Yankee Jim Robinson. He was someone who was described as trouble following him pretty much wherever he went. He arrived to San Diego in 1852, which was just a year before Thomas and Anna got married and then they themselves moved out to San Diego to start their new lives. He was not really well liked by the community. So good. He was kind of known as a petty thief. He was known for just kind of like taking things from people. I guess he was known as a smooth talker or he was always able to kind of talk his way out of not receiving some sort of punishment. At one time he kind of took it too far, attempted to steal from the wrong person. He was eventually arrested for attempted grand larceny. He actually tried to steal a boat from the San Diego Harbor, which is wild, but uh, he was caught and arrested and he was convicted in a very, very quick slap bang style, very frontier Western justice trial. And his sentence was to be publicly hung from the gallows until he was no longer breathing, which seems a little excessive. He was brought to a vacant lot next to the cemetery, which was the same lot that Thomas Whaley would build his house on. First of all, Yankee Jim, he's he's a tall guy, okay? He was a very, very tall guy. Even by today's standards, he was tall. He was six foot four. I'm sure back then he just seemed like a giant and a menace to like most people. He was just a really tall guy. It wasn't even a proper gallows that was built. It was literally like constructed off the back of like someone's wagon and someone was supposed to like drive away when he was supposed to be hung. But because he was so tall, the rope that was around his neck was really long. He didn't actually hang. He kind of just ended up writhing and twisting in pain and then ended up suffocating to death and struggled for what some witnesses would recall up to like 45 minutes. And the most notable thing about his death is that his shoes, like the tips of his boots, were like scraping the ground even after he had died. And when Anna heard this, she immediately thought of like the heavy thuds, like and how they kind of like would have that scraping, like thud, scrape, thud, scrape. And because like this was all alleged, we don't know if he actually did steal the boat or like really intend to steal the boat. We don't really know what happened. It just seems like a pretty piss poor way to have to leave this planet, not having it even like done properly and for something that you didn't even like do. I would be mad. My soul would probably have a hard time like finding peace with that. Anna is hearing all of this from her neighbor, right? She finally starts to put two and two together. And so she goes to Thomas and she's like, listen, this is a thing that happened that we witnessed. Yes, witnessed. I think this is the wildest part about this story. Thomas and Anna Whaley were present during the hanging of Yankee Jim Robinson. They saw him struggle and suffocate for 40, up to 45 minutes, allegedly, as, as long as 45 minutes. And they still thought, yeah, this seems like a very nice place to like build a house. And, and raise a family on. Seems like some very peaceful energy that I wanna be a part of. Okay, white people gonna white people, I guess. I'm gonna take a little break. I mean, now that I talk about this more, it makes sense. Like, you would think they would put two and two together and, and be like, oh, okay, like, maybe we should leave. Maybe we should go somewhere else. But they couldn't. They couldn't. It was reported throughout the family so many times throughout the years. As much as they wanted to leave, they just couldn't find it. Something about that house drew them back every time they tried to leave, which I'll get into in a second. I need to try some of this macaroni salad. It's been sitting here long enough. Mmm, okay, yep. Mm-hmm, that was worth waiting for. That was good. Everything about this place is so good. Okay, after it finally settles in her that these events are probably connected in some way, some way that she can't explain 
with human words, with human language. Her and Thomas decide to take their remaining children and they actually left San Diego and they moved back north to San Francisco for about 10 years. I guess I don't, I didn't really know this about the story of this family or the history when I was looking at the history of the house, which I guess is what makes it so interesting is that even when the family like didn't live in it at the time, the building was still being, it was still being used. It was still being operated. There were multiple businesses that would operate within the house and each attempt was always shorter than the last, even though the family didn't live in it during the whole time. Um, it was still always being used and people were always coming in and out of it. So the Whaley's were pretty happy up in San Francisco, but for whatever reason, we don't know why the reason has been lost to history. They decided to move back to the house in Old Town, San Diego um, in 1868. That would be the place where the family would continue to live out the rest of their days. And they actually split their time between the historic Old Town where the original Whaley house was and a single level home that Thomas Whaley had built on State Street, 933 State Street. I'm making a connection because of that. Because there's a, there's a radio station in San Diego, probably like the most popular radio station, called Channel 933, and I wonder if that has anything to do with State Street. That would actually make a lot of sense. Anyways, Thomas Whaley built a single level family, you know, home, a new home in a newer part of San Diego that was called Newtown, but it's now what we know as the gas lamp district in San Diego. From what I read, no one really knows why they decided to come back to San Diego. Anno would say that the property, the home itself, were just doomed and that would be the reason why she endured so much tragedy in her life was because of what happened in that house, in the house itself. I can't help but think it was just kind of like one of those train wreck scenarios where you want to look away but like you just can't. Something pulled them back to that house. I hear this all the time because I watch a lot of like YouTube channels and listen to a lot of ghost story podcasts, real ghost story podcasts where people actually call in or write in their stories. I hear stories all the time of really incredibly haunted houses, poltergeist activity that goes on. A lot of people ask the question, you know, why didn't you just move? Why couldn't you just leave? I mean, and I'm not saying this to like minimize or diminish or kind of level anything like that but it's kind of like when you're in an abusive relationship people kind of act like why didn't you just leave if you saw how bad it was why didn't you just leave unless you've been in that situation you you can't really know what it's like it's it's so much harder than you think to just especially when you're moving and you have a family and there's children involved kind of like how there's also there can be children involved in abusive relationships it's really hard to just up and move and everything your entire life to a new place. I kind of understand if Anna says something pulled them back to that house, I believe it. I've had experiences kind of like with that. There's one house in the neighborhood that I grew up in in San Diego that was known for really weird paranormal activity. If you know, you know. Maybe I'll talk about that in another video, but I mean, I get it. Because the town started shifting businesses, because the town started shifting businesses and like residential areas to the Newark town, the new town, over time, the Whaley house kind of started to lose the luster and the appeal that Thomas Whaley had originally thought it was going to have and exude for decades to come. This is so much food, oh my God. I'm literally gonna be set for like, like the next 24 hours, Jesus. Water. How do we look? decent. One thing that certainly did not add to the charming features of the Whaley House uh, occurred on August 18th, I believe. August 18th, 1885. So about three and a half years prior to this, uh, two of the Whaley's daughters were married in that house. Unfortunately, Violet, the younger daughter, would have a harder time in her marriage than her sister did. As it turned out, the man that she married was a man named George T. Bertolacci. Bertolacci, I believe that's how you might pronounce his name. He actually turned out to be a fraud and a con artist. He only married Violet for the substantial dowry that he believed he was going to collect after marrying her. I've been savoring that mac and cheese. That shit is so good. This guy marries Violet because he thinks he's going to get a lot of money out of it, right? So one morning, Violet wakes up when they are traveling across the country 
on a train for their honeymoon, she wakes up to find her husband completely gone with the money she's by herself. I, I, I wouldn't really know what to do in that situation, especially because of how young she was at the time. But eventually she decided to come back to San Diego to live with her family at their house um, in Old Town. Because of the strict morals and kind of the upper middle class culture of the time, when she came back, she was essentially shamed and shunned from people in her class and people in her community. Not only was she divorced, but when she arrived back to San Diego, she arrived by herself completely alone, which was something that women, young women of that time did not do. It was very improper if you were a woman to travel unaccompanied or unchaperoned. This just placed an enormous amount of public shame and humiliation on her. She spent the last few years of her life living at her family's house, not really leaving her bedroom a whole lot. Unfortunately, because of how much grief and sorrow she faced, she would end up taking her father's 32 caliber gun and on August 18th, 1885, she ended up shooting herself in the chest and she left behind a suicide note that read, Mad from life's history, swift to death's mystery, glad to be hurled anywhere, anywhere out of this world. Which is just so heartbreaking. She was only 22 at the time of her death. She was like around 19 when she got married and then when all of this happened to her. Lots of tragedy that continued on in this family. And then to kind of add insult to injury, her younger sister Corinne was engaged at the time all of this was happening and her fiance ended up calling off the engagement and breaking off the relationship because of what, it, what had been happening with her family and the scandal that it was causing. It, it was after all of these kind of tragic events that Thomas Whaley decided to just completely move his family to the 933 State Street address, leaving behind the Whaley house, which would kind of sit vacant for a couple of decades. And in that time, many of the Whaley family members got older and they got sick. Thomas Whaley ended up dying in the State Street home just five years after Violet had committed suicide. He was 67 years old. In the early 1900s, Thomas's son Francis Hinton Whaley decided to try and restore the Whaley house and kind of open it up as like a historical tourist attraction. But neighbors and others in the community would report very shortly after he moved in and began the restoration process, they reported some really, really odd behavior from Francis. He would shut all of the doors and the windows, shut all the curtains, all the shutters, just kind of make it as dark as possible in this house. And it was reported that he would try and communicate with the spirits of the house, possibly his family members that had already passed on. I need to keep eating. There's just so much. Oh my God. I feel like I really only eat half. Hmm. <laughs> Green salt is so good. There we go. Francis eventually moved his own family back into the Whaley house when he was restoring it. And everyone around him that saw him do this was just like, why? Like, if you truly believe that the spirits of that home and the energy of that house had has affected you and has affected your family so much and brought you so much pain and suffering, why would you bring your family back to the place that has caused you that? Because it wasn't just Francis and his kids and his wife that he brought with him, it was his immediate family members. Anna, Thomas's widow, moved back in. And then I believe his uh, brother George, Anna's other son, and then his sister Corinne, the younger Whaley daughter, they all moved back in and continued to spend the rest of their days living at this house. And it really, it just really seems as much as they wanted to move away from this location that they couldn't. Anna ended up passing away in 1913. Francis died just a year later after that. George Whaley, I believe, uh, died in 1928. And then Corinne, the last surviving immediate family member, she passed away in 1953 at the age of 88 years old. She was even reported as telling like boarders that lived there and her in-home caregivers that she wanted to leave the house, but she quote, like she just 
couldn't. She just couldn't get away. She just couldn't leave. And a lot of people kind of understood why. Other people witnessed like weird things that happened in that house. Missed mist-like apparitions in the hallways, lights that would kind of flicker on and on by themselves. It was also very common to hear the crying or the laughter of a baby or the little pitter-patter of uh, baby feet on the floor. So in 1960, the San Diego Historical Shrine Foundation ended up saving the home and opened it up as a museum and as a tourist attraction. It's been operating that way ever since. In the year 2000, it's been maintained by the Save Our Heritage Foundation. Of course, because it's been open to the public for the last 60 years, uh, there's been a lot of reportings, a lot of people that have come through in the public and not public eye. It's been featured on a bunch of different paranormal investigative TV shows, reality TV shows. Many psychics and mediums have come through reporting very similar experiences, experiencing different or different and same energies at the same time. Ghost Adventures has been there, America's Most Haunted on the Travel Channel. There was even a very low budget, low grade, I have to say, movie that was made about it that wasn't even filmed at the Whaley House. Anyone that knows me knows that I actually do not fuck with scary movies like that. I'm very particular when it comes to what kind of scary movies I watch. I do not fuck with paranormal or supernatural scary movies at all. So the fact that I was able to watch that tells you how bad of a movie it was. I'm not gonna say what the name is, you can look it up if you want, but it was not good. So if you're into like really bad horror movies, you might love that. One, it wasn't even shot. It's very obvious too, like if you know the movie, if you know, if you know the Whaley House and know Old Town and know San Diego, know what it looks like, and then you watch this movie, you'd be like, where, where is that? Where is that? There's just so much that's happened, that's been reported there. The most obvious being the really heavy sounds of the boots that have been reported as being Yankee Jim's boots. The sound of the baby laughing and crying can be heard in the attic. It's believed that all of these kind of baby sounds are the little ghost of Thomas Whaley Jr. There's just so much that happens, you know, chairs rock back and forth. Curtains are seen fluttering both from the inside and outside when there shouldn't be people in or near those places where the curtains are fluttering. Invisible fingers seem to strike the keys of the piano when there shouldn't be anyone touching the piano or some anywhere near the piano. It's also said that the sound of a gavel can be heard from when the building was used as a county, as the county courthouse. Musical instruments and laughter can be heard from the upper second story rooms from when that those rooms were being used as like a green room for a theater troupe when it was used as a commercial, you know, the first commercial theater in San Diego. It is reported like crazy that there is a lot of personal experiences that happen on the ninth step of the staircase leading up to the second floor. Visitors and tourists, museum volunteers, and people that work for the museum or work at the store next door, they have reported feeling cold spots on that specific step while also feeling like enormous amounts of pressure in their head. One of my best friends from high school said that she actually dated someone who went to go, you know, visit the, the Whaley house. She was kind of taunting the spirits, you know, trying to get a rise out of them. Very shortly after, she said that she had to leave because she started feeling a lot of like, just like her head was like gonna explode. Even though the door to Violet's bedroom on the second story is locked, visitors and tourists will report hearing like rustling on the other side, like like she's on the other side of the door. Others have reported even hearing like muffled cries if they like listen really closely. A lot of people have reported seeing a young woman near Violet's bedroom, like what would have been her bedroom, uh, seeing a young woman there. And also feeling like a really deep, profound sense of sadness when they are near Violet's bedroom. Of course, Thomas and Anna are seen around the Whaley house as well. Thomas is reported as wearing pantaloons and like a long coat and a top hat, like he's about to go out for the evening, go out for a social event. Anna has been seen wearing a green like gingham dress and kind of doing like needlework or just kind of like making sure the home is in order. It's very clear that the energy that is at the Whaley house 
is very much there to stay. Obviously, it's been there for almost about a century and a half, over a century and a half, I guess now. And I think that's what makes this house and its story so interesting is because of the land and because of the history behind this home and their family. Even when Anna claimed multiple times that there was something that had like attached itself to her, she still couldn't shake the feeling that, you know, she, she had to be at this house, she couldn't leave. And I keep going back to Thomas Whaley when she first said there's something wrong and he got mad at her and said, there's nothing wrong, we are staying here, there's nothing wrong with the house, get used to it. I feel like he was kind of dooming himself and his family that they were truly going to remain there for the rest of their lives and in the afterlife. There really was so much history of San Diego that this house witnessed. So much tragedy too, that's the thing. Like there was just so much sadness that surrounded this family because of their decision to build on a cemetery, build on stolen native land, then build on top of a cemetery, first of all, and then build on the grounds where you witnessed, you personally witnessed a man hang to death. And then those same homeowners, they lose two of their children at different points of their life in that house. They also lose their business. They have to move and then they come back. It just, it really does make you think about like family curses and like generational curses and ancestors and all that good stuff. But but that is all that I had. I feel like there's so much more food that I did not get to eat. Look at this. There's definitely gonna be a lot of food left over. Lunch for tomorrow. But that is all that I had for this first episode. I really don't know what it's gonna be called. I wanted to do like haunted high history because of, you know, or I could call it like I know like Alton Brown's like good eats, but like boot eats, but like that doesn't have a good ring to it. I'll think of something. Thank you guys for watching. Whatever haunted places in the country you would like me to look into, let me know. I think that's all I have. I'm gonna go take a nap after I upload these videos to my computer because I actually I kind of want to start the fun process editing. But anyways, I'm rambling. Um, thank you for joining me and I will see you the next video, the next time I do this. Probably not going to be for at least a week or 10 days because this is a lot of food, okay? You're lucky that I love paranormal shit so much. Okay, well, I hope you have a good day. I hope you guys make good choices. I hope you are staying safe. Bada bing, bada bye. Okay, bye. <laughs>